Good morning. The House Chair Committee on Agriculture will come to order. Would the clerk please take the attendance? Chairwoman Miller? Here. Representatives Price? Present. Stone? Here. Young? Present. Kofia? Devendorf? Fitzgerald? Here. Reingans? We need to. Nyer, uh, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> here. Vanderwald? Present. Roth? Here. Beerline? Here. Smith? Present. Madam Clerk, you have a quorum. Thank you. We need a motion to adopt the minutes from February 15th, 2023. Rep. Pice moves to adopt the minutes. We will now move into presentations from Michigan Farm Bureau. Please come up and introduce yourselves. And members, if you can hold your questions to the end of the meet meeting, that would be very helpful. Good morning, Ms. Chair, members of the committee. Appreciate your time this morning to just talk a little bit about Michigan Farm Bureau, our mission, and how we interact with the agriculture industry. Um, with me today, I am Rebecca Park, and at the microphone is Ben Terrell. In the cheap seats are Rob Anderson and Andrew Vermeesh rounding out the state government relations team, and we also have John Adamy, part of our communications team at Farm Bureau. <clears throat> so I thought I'd just give a little bit of history about Farm Bureau and how we got started, and like I said, our role with the agriculture industry here in Michigan. So we were founded in 1919. We are the state's largest general farm organization, and we represent more than 41 farm families across the state of Michigan. We got our original grounding um, from farmers that felt like they needed representation in Lansing. Everything's cyclical, right? At the time, we were talking about road funding. We seem to still be talking about road funding. But they felt like they needed an advocacy voice in Lansing. So as I said, we're grassroots, member-driven. We have a policy direction that's developed annually, which I'll talk about in a moment. We rely on our county farm bureaus and their expertise at the local level. We have young farmer programs where we teach leadership, uh, promotion and education, and then outreach, and I'll talk more about that. And then obviously, political action and policy work. So our policy development process really is grassroots based. Our county farm bureaus, our farmer members come together and say, this is an issue that we've got in agriculture and I think that we need to have a particular position on it. So they talk about it at the local level, they vote on it at the county annual meeting there. If they agree at the county annual, then it goes to our state policy development committee. That's a 20 member committee that changes over every other year. So every year we're getting a half, half of the committee changes over. We do that purposefully, understanding that agriculture is always changing and we want to make sure that we're keeping up with the new issues that are going on in the agriculture industry. So that 20 member committee will work through every single, we call them resolutions, basically they're ideas or problems that's happening in the countryside. In my short time at Farm Bureau, I think the least number of issues that we've worked through was 600 and I think the most was about 1,200 in one year. At the end of that process, they come up with their recommendation and they take that to our voting delegates. Most of the time that meeting is held right after Thanksgiving and we've had it in Grand Rapids the last several years. At the end of that process, those voting delegates might agree with the policy development committee. They might say, nope, try again. But at the end of the process, when the gavel falls, we get this policy development book. Each of your offices should have received this at least by last week, if not before. This is essentially our marching orders for our ways to interact with you guys downtown in the legislative arena. So part of our um, Part of our programming includes promotion and education. And so through this particular subset of Farm Bureau, we have programs like Ag in the Classrooms, where volunteers can go into a classroom and actually teach a science-based lesson. We have in-service education for teachers available, safety programs, we do Project Red or Rural Education Day. These look differently. Sometimes we'll bus kids out to a farm and they'll go through sort of stations, if you will. Um, and other times we've actually taken farm animals to the school itself for Project Red Days. We do farm to Tours, we have activities at local fairs, and then um, adopt a classroom. The goal for the promotion and education is to really educate the public about agriculture through various projects. Children are certainly part of that focus, but also adults and others through the county fair. Um, farm Science Labs. So this is something that's newer to the Farm Bureau realm. We currently have two labs on the road. It's a 40-foot mobile classroom that has the latest teaching technology um, to teach STEM-based lessons that are aligned with the next generation science standards. Um, 
as well as national ag literacy outcomes. The Farm Science Lab reinforces grade level standards with hands-on science opportunities for our kids. COVID changed a whole lot of things and we had to get creative when the mobile labs could not operate. And so we came up with this idea of farm crates. And so you can see up on the screen what each farm crate has, but if you wanted, someone could sponsor a farm crate for a teacher. Every month they would get a crate that contains all of this grade level based activity that's hands on focused on kindergarten through fifth grade. <clears throat> just a couple of high level Michigan agriculture facts knowing that we're just getting started in the year. The food and ag industry contributes over 100 billion, I think Director Anger used 104 billion annually to the state's economy. Michigan food and ag system employs about 22% of the workforce and Michigan is the only state in the nation with a reliable water source to produce over 300 different types of commodities. You might hear some people say, or those of you that have been around might have heard, we're the second in the nation to California. I can't take responsibility for the change, but I think it's very accurate. We are the only state with a reliable source of water producing that number of commodities. In addition to all of the other programming that we do on behalf of Michigan agriculture and interacting with our farmers, we are a family of companies. Many of you may know us for other offerings that we have besides our farmer advocacy side of things. As that family of companies, we decided to adopt a four purpose mission. Our four purpose mission is to end childhood hunger. <clears throat> More than 350 County Farm Bureau employees Agents, their staff, they logged more than 1,000 volunteer hours to develop, over, to deliver rather, one million meals to families across the state of Michigan. In this last year, we had a great apple crop. And in September, recognizing the excess apples, our MACMA manager, uh, Michigan Ag Commodity, uh, Michigan Apple Commission manager, Don Drake, and found a member over in the Kent County area willing to donate apples. And so volunteers went over and picked over 20,000 pounds of apples that were able to go into the West Michigan Food Bank Council. This is a photo of a couple of our agents that decided to try something new. And they named it, it's a pilot project at this point, the Agent Fresh Food Hub. Um, they partnered with a local school and they provided over 30 families that were in need with groceries, including things like apples and milk, eggs, potatoes, some frozen meat, um, and even some non-perishable food items. Like I said, it's in the pilot project, but they're looking through this idea of, could we expand this into other communities? Could we do it through an entire school year and really help to feed families that are in need? With that, I'm gonna turn it over to Ben. Good morning, Madam Chair, members of the committee. It's now my pleasure to dive down further into several key current areas of focus and engagement for our organization. And perhaps the biggest challenge facing agriculture today in our state is related to workforce. We face an unprecedented shortage of the human talent our industry needs to move forward. We are very excited about the opportunities in Michigan agriculture, and we hope to collaborate with you all during the coming session to continue working to attract into our industry at nearly every level. Um, excuse me. Uh, Michigan Farm Bureau works uh, extensively to promote the agriculture industry potential participants, whether those be individuals wanting to be farmers themselves or those looking for a good paying career in various support industries. We work with a variety of partners to highlight educational programs or vocational training that allow individuals to obtain the diverse set of skills needed to work in modern agriculture. We also maintain an organizational, a strong organizational commitment to protect the workers already involved in our industry. Michigan Farm Bureau has hosted, sponsored, or otherwise participated in countless trainings for the agricultural community, helping those involved identify the risks inherent on their farms or at their jobs through hazard assessment, understanding safety regulations and best practices, and through planning for emergencies like grain bin entrapments, fires, or farm machinery related accidents. Finally, our members and staff remain engaged in a wide range of issues that affect the agriculture and food industry workforce including the specific needs of seasonal and migratory workers. Michigan Farm Bureau is actively involved in Michigan's Interagency Migrant Services Committee, the MDARD Migrant Labor, Advi Labor Housing Advisory Board, and numerous other conversations surrounding promoting the health and safety of the entire agricultural community. As I mentioned, uh, the state's agriculture and food system has acute workforce and talent needs. However, part of this need is based on specific sets of skills. 
Farmers and other agricultural industry workers increasingly require certifications or other training to do the increasingly complex and technology-driven work. A commercial driver's license, or CDL, might be an obvious example, but in modern agriculture, food safety certification or a drone pilot's license might be just as likely. The pandemic made these vulnerabilities clear, as a shortage of people available to do certain tasks at times brought the food system to a near halt and resulted in product shortages. Some of the best one-time investments we might be able to make are in our own Michigan workers and the skills they need to build a more resilient supply chain. One of our current priorities is considering potential ways to help rebuild our workforce capacity through trainings and certifications. Michigan, far Michigan farms work extensively with the Michigan Department of Labor and Economic Opportunity to recruit for their labor needs. In the ag industry, there is naturally a seasonal flux in demand for labor on farms. With sufficient workforce being absolutely vital at critical points during growing or harvest periods, almost all such agricultural positions now offer over $17 an hour, not including other benefits or production-related incentives. While such rates have enticed a small number of additional workers, a vast majority of such positions remain unfilled. To help alleviate this issue and ensure that harvests are not left to spoil in our state's fields, in 2015, Michigan Farm Bureau started Great Lakes Ag, Ag Labor Services. Today, this company is the state's largest contract H-2A guest worker filer, helping to bring around 2,200 seasonal guest workers to the state. Of course, whether guest workers, domestic employees, or farmers themselves, any workforce needs a place to live. However, a current housing shortage is affecting nearly all the industries in our state. Michigan agriculture currently has a quality housing stock that gives our farms a competitive advantage in competing for workforce with other states. However, the pandemic and trends in remote work have further exacerbated housing shortages in many rural areas. Investments, investment is needed to build and renovate housing to maintain our competitiveness in this area. The governor's FY24 budget proposes $15 million for migratory agricultural worker housing grants, potentially to be dispersed through the Michigan State Housing Development Authority, or MISHTA. The details of this potential program will be important, but this could be a positive start. However, a greater investment is likely needed. The MDARD Migrant Labor Housing Advisory Board identified a statewide need of $50 million to ensure adequate supply of the highest quality housing. Switching gears from workforce, Michigan Farm Bureau is also heavily engaged on issues of environmental stewardship. Farmers are the original conservationists, and our member, member developed policy, in numerous instances, espouses this sentiment. In fact, our policy states that, and I quote, Michigan Farm Bureau members should lead the conversation on the definition of sustainable agriculture. As such, our members and staff are heavily engaged in the Michigan Agriculture Environmental Assurance Program, or MEEP, Advisory Council, the state's Water Use Advisory Council, and countless other national, state, and local conservation programs, like local farm service agency boards, or USDA, Natural Resource Conservation Service Partnerships, conservation districts, watershed groups, conservation clubs, and so on. As an organization, we have also been working hard to help members understand emerging climate and ecosystem service uh, programs. Our current activities focus on providing members information, health, helping them understand these opportunities, and locate the assistance they need on negotiating potential contracts or other agreements. The growing need for technical information related to, to these emerging topics has led to our involvement in the Securing Environmentally Sustainable Michigan Agriculture, or SEASMA, initiative. SEASMA is based on the extremely successful model of Project GREEN, an acronym that stands for Generating Research and Extension to Meet Economic and Environmental Needs. This, this unique program operates as a partnership between industry, <coughs> MDARD, and MSU, identifying emerging and vital needs in Michigan's plant-based industries. Issues like invasive pests or plant disease have often, rapid, often been rapidly addressed and ameliorated with the help of Project Green. The program has been calculated to have generated over $2 billion in, economic, in estimated economic impact for the state. The SEASMA initiative focuses on extending the successful approach into targeted long-term research, outreach, and education to further enhance Michigan's status as a national leader in agricultural sustainability. Potential areas of research identified by the coalition include bolstering plant and soil health, understanding of soil carbon sequestration and protection of water quality, innovative technologies and strategies for improving water use efficiency, and the overall de deployment of next generation precision technologies in agriculture. I'll now turn it over to Rebecca for one final priority. 
Thank you. Uh, so we talked a little bit about, Ben shared, you know, the need for, for people in agriculture. We need farmers, we need workers, we need it all together. And so to that end, we have been talking about this concept of a beginning farmer tax credit. Is there a role that the state could play to get those, say, established farmers that maybe want to get out of farming? Maybe they're ready to retire, but they don't have anyone to come back and take over the farm. Is there a role that the state could play to connect those people with those wanting to get into the agriculture industry? It's extremely capital intensive to get into ag, and so it rarely costs or cash flows over the first year. It often takes generations, and that's why we have so many generations farms here in Michigan. So just furthering that conversation with the committee would be of interest to us. I can tell you uh, there is a bill that was introduced in the Senate, Senate Bill 11 by Senator Bellino. Um, but as I did some research, this looks very different depending on the state. Some people do, some states I should say, do a tax credit, some do a bond, some do a grant program. But just having that conversation of how do we help people um, that might be new to the industry get their feet underneath them. So with that, Madam Chair, I, if I can take a little bit of, of privilege here, in front of you, you have the Ag Book of the Year. So American Farm Bureau Federation adopts an Ag Book every year. Understanding that March's reading month is upon us. Um, if you choose to read this book to any of your classrooms um, that you're going into and you're able to get a photo, make sure you abide by all the classroom rules, um, school rules there. But my card is in there. If you'd like to email it or text it to me, we would love to share the fact that our Ag Committee is out there helping to promote ag literacy in the classroom. Um, at your deference, if I could get all the members that are comfortable to put the book up in front of them, if I could get John to take a photo of you guys, would that be okay? It's fine with me. After the, after the meeting, that would be great. After the meeting? Yes. Okay, thank you very much. All right. And that's all we have, Madam Chair. Yes, and getting to your point, when I learned that I was chair of agriculture, we immediately, and when I say we, I mean my chief of staff, Jackson Paul, and I started meeting with farming families who are members of Farm Bureau. And we had frank conversations and we noticed, and it was very obvious that these farms are disappearing, the kids aren't going into it, and we need to do something. Absolutely. Some of these farms are 100 years old and been in, in the families for generations, and there's just not anyone to go on further with that. And that's a real concern, and we have to address it education-wise. We've got to give incentives to, you know, and, and promote that farming is, can be vital. It could be a great career, and we need to do our part there. And during some of these conversations, as a matter of fact, when Jackson and I said, well, what are you, some of your concerns? What's your priority? We heard back that right to repair was one of the top priorities. So that being said, I have a question because I just learned that the American Farm Bureau so a Federation and John Deere signed a, a, memo, a, a memo of understanding regarding the right to repair, and I wanted to know if you supported this, since it is such an important priority for your members. Absolutely. Yeah, that has been a topic that has been a conversation piece for a number of years now with our farmers and our implement dealers out there across the state. Um, so we were happy to see AFBF and John Deere join together in that MOU. I would be surprised if we don't see some other uh, implements coming on board, other brand names that you would recognize come on board with a similar understanding. Yes, yeah, so it's very important that they can handle these repairs on their own. All right, thank you. Moving on, Rep. Pice, you had a question. Thank you. Um, I was, you talked a lot about your priorities, which is great. I was wondering if you had any specific ones for this legislative session, and I'm wondering if any of them. Uh, include uh, local or urban uh, farming or agriculture and how you're working with that? Yeah, I could take that. So our, in terms of your first question, uh, Representative, our, our priorities are kind of interwoven in there. We're, we're working on, you know, potentially finding funding for, for work, worker training, workforce training and development, uh, for worker housing. Um, I mentioned the, the SEASMA initiative, and then as Rebecca mentioned, um, beginning farmer programs, talking, having that conversation. I, I think to follow up on your second question, I, I don't know that we make, you know, a real 
distinction there. We're, we're, we're really, as I, as I alluded to, uh, you know, in the business of trying to recruit farmers everywhere in agriculture. We need people, not just farmers, but people to work on farms, people to work in associated industries. And so um, I think that recruitment is very broad and, and is inclusive of those aspects as well. So we didn't call those out. I think that's part of, you know, part of our member policy and part of what we're interested in having a discussion about. Uh, a real quick thing for that. I know um, at least a year, a couple of years ago, the USDA was doing food boxes. I know they were doing that in Detroit for organizations and cities to come by, pick them up, and distribute for free. Uh, you worked with, with the USDA of this? I, that's what I'm wondering, if, if, if that was a, a, a project that you did together with them. You know, I can't speak to that directly. I mean, we have a lot of interaction with the USDA and the Michigan branches of the USDA. So I, I'm sure that, you know, on some level we were, we were involved as well. I don't know if Rebecca has anything to, to add to that. Uh, so we were supportive of Eastern Market doing those food boxes. We were uh, familiar with it, and some of our members may have participated in that USDA program. As an organization, we didn't per directly participate. Okay. Yeah, it wasn't with, the, with the, like, Eastern Market or any of those. I, as I recall, they were... Um, given out from the rooftop of the uh, Huntington place, uh, we'd come by with a, a U-Haul and uh, pick up a lot and take them to a food bank. But thank you for answering that. Thank you. State Rep. Nyer, please. I can briefly comment on that. That was a federal program through the Relief Act, um, and it was limited in scope. Uh, several organizations, uh, a lot, most of them local, did take up on those opportunities. Most of them associated with, with your school systems, trying to get through summer feeding programs there. Uh, United Dairy Industries was heavily involved in that, was uh, uh, one of the coordinators to provide uh, milk, which was a perishable product and had to be handled specially, but uh, it, was, it was more directed towards the uh, summer feeding programs is where they saw most of those uh, programs get set up around because the school systems already had the natural uh, systems in place and logistics in order to get that food out to the, to the students and to the people that needed it. Thank you. State Rep. Fitzgerald. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, thank you for your presentation today. And uh, within that presentation, I heard a lot about migrant workforces and uh, how we are supporting those who are here uh, on HUA programs or, or otherwise. Um, over the weekend, we had a uh, article in the New York Times that outlined um, some exploitative practices for especially child migrant labor. What my question uh, to you all today is, is do you have a published stance um, on the use of underage workers in the agriculture industry? Um, and how are you working to support those persons? How are we ensuring that those people are treated fairly um, and that children are not being exploited um, for the gain of, uh, of agricultural uh, administrators. You know, the, the industries uh, outlined in that article were not necessarily farming, but agricultural adjacent, and so would love to hear your position on that today. Yeah, thank you for your question, Representative. And that's a really important and timely question. So I, I think just to start, um, you know, I, our policy is explicit about, you know, encouraging and informing producers and in that, you know, our, having members follow existing laws as, as they pertain to labor. So obviously wage laws, I know there's some wage issues there and obviously youth labor laws there. So um, you know, our, our policy is very clear on that um, and, and would obviously oppose something as, you know, as tragic as what happened in that situation. Um, you know, and I guess just to relate, I mean, I haven't been on every farm in Michigan. There are 50 some odd thousand farms in Michigan, but um, you know, all of my experience and what I can testify to you today is that uh, vast majority of you know, all the farms that I've come into contact with, their workers are, are a very valuable part of their team. They're like family. And in many instances, they spend more time with the workers that they work on their farm. They work alongside these people and care very deeply for them. So, um, you know, it, it's, it's a tragedy and, and something that, you know, I think obviously we hope doesn't exist anywhere outside of the examples that were, were alluded to. If I may, Madam Chair, um, my only hope would be that we continue to see Michigan Farm Bureau continue to advocate on behalf of those uh, of those good practices that you uh, clearly stand by, and to ensure that you know you as are as as well advocates in the sense that we can ensure that children are not being exploited 
uh, in, within the agriculture industry here in, in the state of Michigan, which was clearly dependent upon migrant labor. So thank you very much. Absolutely. Thank you. State Rep. Vanderwall. Thank you, Madam Chair. Appreciate it. And thank both you for being here today. Um, in your presentation, we talked about uh, a lot of things. And I guess real quick, how many acres of farmland do we have in operation in the state of Michigan? Do you happen to know that? Roughly 10 million. 10 million acres. The other question I have that pertains to that is how do we believe with the expansion of solar in, in some of the areas that we're looking at and competing with the farm community? What is the... Uh, what do you feel those are the drawbacks, or what are the drawbacks with that, and what what do we expect it could do to our food supply here in the state of Michigan? Sure, thank you for the question, Representative. Um, just to try and answer your question, and I think that's a very deep and complicated question. There's probably others, you know, even on our team that are better suited to answer that question, but um, just as very high level, um, you know, our policy supports primarily local control, local decision making in, in those decisions. I don't think it's entirely clear how many acres of solar would be needed, right? There's a big conversation about where that's put and, and how, how those projects are cited. So, um, you know, it's, it's an issue our members are talking a lot about. Um, it's, it's an opportunity in some instances for farms to find additional revenue source that they can stay in business. But obviously there's this um, issue of preserving farmland. And so, um, it's a back and forth. I'm not sure I can give you a, a good indication on the overall impact because I'm not sure that we know, you know, especially given developments in solar, how many acres of solar will ultimately be cited. Representative Stone, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I appreciate the presentation. Um, and after listening to the conversations, I think I have three questions that I ended up with. Um, I'll take it one at a time. Is Michigan attracting enough migrant workers to fulfill our workforce needs? No. How, how short are we? That, that's a great question. Um, you know, I could just tell you that we're vastly short. I can't give you a specific number, um, but we are we're very short. And, and I don't know that that, you know, in terms of your question, not all of those workers obviously have to or are migratory workers, but we are mm -hmm. vastly short on, on human talent in, in, in our industry. Um, second part is education. I was thrilled with the resources that you have targeted at education. And even though I represent largely an urban um, district, I'd be curious to see how we can bring some of these resources into our community. So I'd like to discuss that more. Um, And I didn't write the third question down before I got, it got to me. I'll, I'll circle back if I think of it. Thanks. Thank you, Representative Stone. I'm, we're going to move on to Representative Young. Thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you all for being here with us on today. So I just happened to be the chair of families, right? Families, children, and seniors. So you guys said a bunch that really got me excited. So be expecting an invitation. Uh, to come and present before my committee because I really want to do a deep dive into your uh, for purpose mission to end childhood hunger. You all know that we're having that rollback of SNAP benefits, right? And it's very, very concerning for just all of us. I, I think I can say that, yeah, and, and it kicks in today. And so I'd really be interested. You can share a little bit now, but you can do a deep dive later on how you think what you all are doing can help support families um, in your quest to end childhood hunger, because that is gonna have a significant impact on our families and our children. I'll just talk a little bit about that. I mean, certainly we know that it's challenging for students when they go into the school and they're hungry. And we know that hunger doesn't see boundary lines. They don't, it doesn't care whether you're urban or you're rural. I can tell you in talking with many of my, my ag uh, teachers across the state, they say, gosh, I wish I had a box of granola bars in my desk because it comes to the third hour and my kids are hungry and they can't focus the same way. So we know that this has a big impact. And, and part of this, we're actually working on a pilot study with U of M. I can't get into all the details on it yet because it hasn't all been published yet. But I know we're looking at what could happen if we could change that trajectory 
trajectory of those students that are hungry? Could they learn better? Could they learn more? Could they, you know, what would then that look like for the rest of the path of their life if we could just fix that one piece? So love to have more conversations with you. Going back to State Rep. Stone. I got it. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you did. <laughs> Broadband coverage. So in Macomb County, uh, you know, being Tri-County area, I was surprised to hear from farmers at the north end of the county that there are um, gaps in broadband coverage, and I know that's true for outstate Michigan as well. Can you speak to some of the inadequacy around broadband utilities? Yeah, thank you, Representative. That's a great question. So huge issue, um, and I mentioned precision agriculture a little bit in my, our presentation, and we could spend two hours on that topic alone, but all the technology coming in, I mean, farmers have, um, you know, a lot of, a lot of opportunity to use sensors and, and um, precision equipment, things like that, but all that takes broadband connection, and so that's an increasing issue, and, and as you've alluded to, I mean, it's a widespread issue in our state, especially in rural areas, and so um, our policy supports greater broadband access for, for rural areas and for farms. Representative Kofia. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, thank you for the presentation and the book. It's yes. really cute. Um, so I wanted to sort of piggyback off of Rep Stone's question about the migrant labor workforce and the fact that, you know, there aren't nearly enough uh, available workers at this time. My region is the 103rd, which includes uh, Leelanau County and Old Mission Peninsula. Um, I have talked to lots of our farmers, right? John Roth over there. Um, it's a big part of our region. He's my colleague from the other half of Grand Traverse County. But um, I guess I would love for you to go into a little more detail if you could in terms of specific barriers to bringing those. I've heard from a lot of the local farmers, but I kind of want to match it up with, with what you all are seeing as the Farm Bureau. Barriers to uh, the migrant workforce being available to continue to do that work and potential policy solutions, if you could, please. I heard the housing piece, but any additional? Well, thank you for the question. I, I think a big part of our, our issue here is that, you know, we first of all need to understand that workforce. And, and we, as part of our collaboration with the Interagency Migrant Services Committee, have been pushing for a while for an enumeration uh, of the folks that, that comprise that population. And that's a big problem. I mean, I think there's, for many obvious national reasons and for pandemic-related reasons, um, there's been shifts in, in those populations. And, and I don't think we fully understand those. So, you know, I'm, I'm not try to be evasive, I'm just not sure I can answer your question, and I'm not sure that a lot of folks could, honestly. We, we need to better understand um, a lot of those reasons. I mean, there are, there are a number of, of potential things that we, you know, we could throw out there, but I don't think we really know until we, until we get out there and we survey those folks and we understand you know, what their needs are and where, where we're lacking, to be very honest with you. But uh, some, of those, some of those national politics and some um, you know, factors related to COVID all, all play a role, but it's hard to know without uh, having that information. Thank you. It's very obvious that you can see the hard work that you've done for your members. It's phenomenal, and I thank you for that. But I can also see from the questions that we've heard today that there's room to grow, there's room to improve, just like anything else. So I look forward to working with all of you to find solutions to some of these issues, frustrations, concerns for the betterment. And I know we can do that because we have such a great committee and we have such great resources and we have you. So again, thank you. I appreciate that. Are there any further questions? Great. All right. Representative Pice moved to excuse absent members. There being no objection, the motion prevailed. And there being no further business from the committee, the committee will be adjourned. Please stay after for a quick photo. We'd appreciate it. Thank you so much, and we'll see you in two weeks. <laughs>